So we're in the middle of the Campeche jungle in the outer ruins of Kalak Mool, which is the great mighty snake kingdom dynasty that existed within the uh, Paten rainforest. Now, a lot of times the Maya don't get credit for moving megalithic blocks, moving blocks that weigh multi, multi tons. But here at this site, we can see incredibly tall, almost obelisk stelas here, or stelae. And I'm not exactly sure what the weight of this is, but it's limestone. And I've seen some at the site of Curigua that are twice as tall that weigh upwards of 75 tons. So I can only assume that this is somewhere around 25 to 30 tons. But this isn't the only example of this. If we come over here, we can see another huge stella. Now the limestone has been getting rained on for nearly 2,000 years. So it doesn't preserve the hieroglyphs very well. But on the side that's leaning over, that's not getting as much exposure to the rain, you can see just ever so slightly the remnants of ancient hieroglyphs left on the stella. Let's come over here, I'll show you another one. The site of Kalak Mool has the most density anywhere in the Maya world of ancient stelae that depict the history of Kalak Mool and the Maya people of this area. Look at this one. So, as you can see, these things are incredibly tall. And surprisingly, this is barely half as tall as some of the taller obelisk or large stelae found in the Maya world. Made out of limestone, it's gotta be around 25 to 30 tons. The hieroglyphs are, are hardly preserved at all on many of these. So, whenever somebody tells you that the Maya didn't move megaliths, now you can certainly see that they did. Look at this one. Wow. Come over here and check this out. And there's another one there. Look how well these are preserved. And look at this. It's also on the side of a temple. You can hardly see this when you're standing here. Unless you're really concentrating, you know what to look for. Eventually you've seen so many of them that you get an eye for what to look out for. But these temples are massive, completely grown over by the jungle. <clears throat> these hieroglyphs would have once told the story of Kalak Mool. Hundreds of years of lost history was once inscribed on all four sides of all of these obelisks or stelae. It's amazing. Check this one out. <clears throat> Again, almost completely eroded, completely indecipherable in its current state. Wow. These, these were quarried from miles away and drug here. Oh, look at this. These are actually preserved well. You can easily see the shapes going down. So a lot of Maya hieroglyphs are uh, depicted in squares, sometimes of, of two to three to four different glyphs. But the quality of these, are so, it's so low and so horribly eroded that uh, I don't think that they can be deciphered at all. Well, look at the size of these things. Amazing. And another third of it goes into the ground. So the Maya are often looked over by the current ancient civilizations pop culture because they seemingly don't have those same large megalithic feats that cultures like the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Peruvians do. 
But the reason that so many people think that is because the jungles of Mesoamerica have swallowed up so much of the Maya world, leaving so much of it under 1500 to 2000 years of jungle growth. It's very much the same reason that we don't really know much about the civilizations that were living deep in the jungles of the Amazon. The only reason that we know as much as we do about the Maya world is because the Maya jungles are only a small fraction of the size of the Amazon. And even with that, the Maya world was more than three times the height of medieval Europe. It's pretty often that we call ancient Egypt the land of the pyramids, but they have about 120 pyramids, whereas in the Maya world, they constructed probably north of 10,000. They were also the ancient world's greatest astronomers, and they could predict astronomical events centuries ahead of time. So all of this is pretty cool, but what really catches people's attention today is what I call megalithomania, where everyone right now is really fascinated by the megaliths of the ancient world. And what I mean are these almost incomprehensibly, impossibly large blocks that ancient cultures moved across mountain ranges, through valleys, through swamps, across water, um, and across deserts. And the mystery of how they move these things, say the Egyptians, for example, how they move these two to 150 ton blocks across sand on maybe some sled of some kind without it being bogged down in the sand, or how they even transported on their small river boats that are woven together. These, this is all a mystery that people are infatuated with. Or let's say in the Inca world, you have blocks that are much, much larger than you find in ancient Egypt that are carried down mountainsides, up mountainsides, and set into place. And these blocks can weigh anywhere from 100 to 200 tons apiece. And on top of that, they're made of basalt largely, so they're not as dense as Egyptian granite. But what that means is when basalt is 200 tons, it means that it is a colossal stone. And how do these things get set in place? That is megalithomania. And that's what we're experiencing in our modern culture. Another great example would be a culture that I am obsessed with, which would be the Olmecs. You have these Olmec heads that weigh anywhere from six to 10 tons. Now, it is commonly believed that they were transported on balsa river rafts. And balsa is a type of wood that you find in the Veracruz to Tabasco region of Mexico, um, more, more or less in the swamps of Mexico. Now, nautical engineers have done research on this and they have shown surprisingly and mysteriously, and it kind of gets looked over because there's no other explanation, I suppose, that academics can come up with. But nautical engineers have shown that if you make a balsa river raft that is too big to go down the Quetzalcoatl River, which is the main tributary that the Olmecs used, if you put a five ton head on a raft too big to go down that river, it would sink that raft. Now, the problem is that the smallest Olmec head is six tons and the largest is 40 tons. So that's a mystery. And that infatuating mystery is what we call megalithomania. And the lack of that seemingly in the Maya world is why the Maya don't get as much attention in the modern day. It's one of the leading causes. But the Maya should have been close to the Olmecs, right? They came after the Olmecs and the Olmecs are commonly attributed as being the mother culture of Mesoamerica. Well, here's the thing. The Maya world probably began on its own without being influenced by the Olmecs in the heart of the Paten jungles of Guatemala, which is really, really far from the Olmec heartland. At the same time, the bedrock that is available to the Maya people is limestone, and a lot of times it's porous limestone. Whereas for the Olmecs, they had access to the basalt quarries in the Tushla Mountains of Veracruz, which is very, very far from the Maya heartland. So the Maya were not mining basalt and building anything out of it. For the most part, the Maya built their buildings out of limestone blocks that weighed anywhere from 40 to 50 pounds to a few hundred pounds to a few tons. That's pretty heavy, but it's not out of the realm of possibility for a small group of men to move blocks like this um, throughout the Maya region, most, most of which is a pretty flat land. You just have to go through the jungle, but it's still relatively reasonable. What's the most surprising aspect about the Maya world is just the sheer amount of work that went into constructing all of their cities. I mean, like I said earlier, Egypt has about 120 pyramids. In the Maya world, I would say way more than 10,000. It's just, it's hard to even comprehend the amount of structures that are in the Maya world. 
In this video, we were at the site of Kalak Mool, which is the capital of the Khan Dynasty, the Snake Kingdom of Campeche, Mexico. And just at this one site alone, LiDAR scans have shown that this site has more than 6,000 buildings in it. However, I think that that's actually a low estimate because when you drive south of Kalakmul, it's a 50 minute drive before you get to the first turn. And at no point when I'm looking out the window, do I ever not see pyramids just a little bit further off through the jungle line? I don't know how many pyramids are out there and that is surprising in and of itself, but it doesn't click until you actually go down there and see it and then it becomes infatuating. But what about the megaliths? Do we see that in the Maya world? Well, yes, we do but they're harder to find because they're in these very small, obscure Maya villages that you have to go down these infinitely long dirt roads just to get to. And on top of that, in a lot of these places, you're out in a region that is so remote that the people go from, in some places in Mexico, speaking a little bit of English, but mostly Spanish, you get more remote, they speak Spanish, but they also speak Maya. Then you get to the point out here in these obscure villages where they just only speak Maya. Some, some of these people don't even speak Spanish. So you're talking about getting very, very far out into these obscure indigenous villages in the jungle before you see things like this. And this is why sites like this and monuments like this and these Maya megaliths haven't made it into popular culture yet. So one site I want to touch on that I thought would be good with pairing with the gigantic stele that are at Kalak Mool is a site in Guatemala called Kirigua. Now, Kirigua was founded at some point between 200 BC and 200 AD. And while at this point, erecting stele was nothing new in the Maya world, when it got to Kirigua, it reached a new height literally. So what these massive stele that are being depicted at Kirigua are is they're kind of like obelisks. I call them stelisks. They're cut on four sides and from top to bottom, they are absolutely ridden with hieroglyphs with no wasted space whatsoever. At this site, you will see the tallest single standing monuments ever discovered in the Americas. So Maya stone artworks looks like Maya hieroglyphs placed next to what is just an artistic interpretation of an ancient lord or ruler, but it's much more complex than that. There is nothing in Maya art that is wasted space or simply designed for aesthetics. Every single piece of these artworks was once understood in an ancient knowledge that is lost to us. The feathers and ornaments that the headdresses depict, their footwear, the orientation of their feet, the position of their hands, the patterns stitched into their clothing, as well as the patterns floating above and around them, all of these symbols were meant to be read like a book. All of them. So unlike the rest of the Maya world, these stelae are carved from some of the hardest and densest sandstone found in the Americas, allowing the reliefs to have such an incredible amount of detail, but also making them very heavy. The largest stelisks weigh anywhere from 50 to 75 tons. One in particular is called Stella E. It is the largest single standing monument erected in the New World nearly 2000 years ago, and it stands just shy of 40 feet tall. But there are other large monuments in Kirigua, including stelas A, B, C, and D, all weighing somewhere between 20 and 50 tons, as well as these bizarre megalithic zoomorphs. Maya stone monuments like this have only been discovered around this area of Guatemala, but they can be seen in the Olmec world and are also an ancient global phenomenon. These are gigantic boulders carved all the way around and even on the bottom, often considered to be some of the finest work ever completed by the Maya. It can be difficult to distinguish in photos, but these zoomorphs are up to 10 feet tall and 18 feet across with a surface area of more than 45 squared meters on a single monument. We have no idea how far away these blocks were quarried or where they were carried from because the jungle in the Maya world is just so dense, it can bury 10 meter tall buildings in less than 500 years. And these monuments have been standing out here for almost 2000. It may not be possible to identify the quarries any longer. Much like the transportation of the Olmec heads, we have no idea of how exactly these got here. And much like the Egyptian obelisks, we have no idea how they were erected to stand in place. Wow. I'm Luke Caverns. If you'd like to see more videos like this of us venturing off into the jungle and showing you things of ancient Maya sites that you've probably never seen before and giving you a really up close and gritty look into this world, well then please like and subscribe for more.